All right, go ahead and turn to John chapter 20. You can probably turn me down just a little bit. John chapter 20, that's where we'll be tonight. As you know, brother Kevin is not here. The reason, it, well, he's here, he's in the building, so <laughs> he's, uh, he's working with our Spanish um, group, our, our small group, I guess, that is quickly turning into a bigger group. Um, he usually does studies on Thursday nights, but he's moving it for their sake to Sunday night at 6 o'clock, so he is busy preparing that to do that in the fellowship hall, and he wanted me to let you know that you are very welcome to come, although he will not be translating, okay, so... Just uh, be aware of that, but you are more than welcome to come. In fact, we definitely encourage that. Um, it's good to see, um, I guess, American or support um, from that, from the English-speaking side, I guess. So just be aware of that. You're always invited. That starts at 6 o'clock on Sunday evenings from now on out. And so they're going to try that and see if it's a little bit better than the Thursday night schedule. So we'll be praying for that congregation. In fact, as you're turning to John chapter 22, I'm going to open this up with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right in because we've got a little bit of uh, ground to cover. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your kindness towards us, God. We thank you that we have the opportunity and the ability to come um, to this building on Sunday nights, Lord, to be able to look at your word, uh, to allow it to change us, to, to morph us into yourself, God, to more uh, an image of you, rather, Lord, and uh, to look more like you. Uh, so that we can look more like you to the world outside these walls, God. I pray that um, as we look at your word, once again, change us and be glorified through it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so as you look at John chapter 20, um, as you know, John is a little bit different uh, gospel than the other three. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels, okay? Then they run in kind of synchrony with each other. Um, and John is kind of out there on his own. John just did his own thing, I guess. So, um, but many times when we look at the resurrection of Christ, right? Last week was Easter. And when we study the resurrection, we think about the day of the resurrection, that morning, right? Um, when, he, when Jesus appears, when he's resurrected, and he appears to um, Mary and the other women of um, kind of his following, of his group. And so um, we very rarely do we look at the actual disciples when he appeared to them. Um, so we're going to look at that tonight, um, verses 19 through 29 there. And Jesus appears to his disciples in kind of a similar fashion on two separate occasions, okay? Um, and particularly we're going to look at one who did not quite believe, who wasn't there during the first visitation, and uh, had to kind of say something like, unless I put my hand in his side or put my finger in his hands, I will never believe. And we all know that is Thomas. Sometimes we coin the phrase doubting Thomas based on this passage, okay? So, yeah, as Ms. Charlotte pointing to Tom there. So, yeah, so uh, I want you guys to feel just comfortable asking questions tonight. That's okay. You can ask questions. I encourage that. And I'm going to ask you a few, okay? So just be prepared to... To, uh, to answer me, so don't fall asleep, all right, because I may call on you, right, as the teacher says. So, um, but yeah, once again, the difference between the Gospels, um, some skeptics, some people who are not of the Christian faith, and even some that are, in a sense, uh, I would question that, but some skeptics discredit the Bible, stating that the Gospels, and specifically John versus the rest of the others, um, are not in synchrony, right? They're not in synchrony. They, they kind of... Uh, we'll, we'll put one story here and at the beginning of a gospel, and that same story we'll see at the end of another or somewhere around that. Uh, one example is the parables, right? This morning we learned about that, how Matthew kind of puts all the parables in one chapter, Matthew chapter 13. If you want to know a parable, you want to know when Jesus talks about the parables, that's usually the chapter that we go to, Matthew chapter 13, where Luke and Mark kind of spread them out in different spots, right? And so some skeptics will say, hey, um, that's... That's why the Bible isn't true, because look at these guys. They're, they don't know where the, when the story happened, and it's kind of spread out everywhere, and they kind of use that to discredit things, right? But really what we're looking at here, and one argument you could say against that, is we're looking at two different accounts of the same experience, right? We're looking at two different accounts of the same experience. Let me give you an example of this, what this would look like in modern day life. Say you're uh, driving along Hardy Street, right, and it's uh, got traffic, 
And so, uh, and somebody's on their cell phone right in front of you, and then they freak out and slam on brakes, and you and your husband or your wife are in the car, and you hit them on the back end, right? And so the police come, and they say, well, what happened, you know? Well, the husband may say, well, this person just slammed on brakes, and I didn't even see, you know, I didn't even know. I was driving along. I was looking at the road, looking at the turn signal up above me, and they just slammed on brakes, and boom, I hit them, right? Where the wife may say, well, actually, they were on their phone. I saw them. They were on their phone. They actually swerved a little bit, and we hit them, right? So really the same experience, but two different accounts, you follow me? And so when we look at the Gospels, when we come across a passage like the parables, or even the passage that we're looking at tonight, um, I want you to just be encouraged by that, that we're, although God is the ultimate author, we're also looking through the lens of the authors that actually penned the Gospels themselves, okay? And so, and that'll make more sense as I get into that. Why are you telling me about that, Nick? I'll, I'll tell you in just a minute, okay? So hold on to there. Um, so as we look at John chapter 20, there's really three truths I want us to understand from this passage. So let's go ahead and read that passage. John chapter 20, it's a, it's a big passage, so just stay seated. And uh, we'll read 19 through 29. It says, on the evening of that day, this is the day of the resurrection, right? Uh, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. And said to them, peace be with you. Now, right off the bat, we learned something there, right? Jesus basically just went through this room, right? He, the doors were locked. The disciples were scared. The Jews had just killed Jesus. They don't know that the resurrection has happened yet. They've been told that the resurrection happened, but they don't quite believe it yet, right? They're ready to see. So sometimes we point to Thomas, but even these disciples, they don't believe quite yet either. Jesus appears to them. It freaks them out. So he says, peace be with you, right? Let's continue reading in verse 20. When he had said this... He showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness of, from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. <laughs> Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I wonder what the disciples were talking about those eight days, right? I mean, Thomas may have been the only one who didn't believe. He was, no telling where he was at when the, Jesus first appeared to the disciples. But I think that's really interesting that the disciples, I know if I had just seen Jesus being resurrected from the dead, I actually saw the nails on his hands and the um, hole in the side of his um, flesh, that that's all I would be talking about, right? And Thomas still did not believe, right? He wouldn't even believe his friends, right? Until he said, in fact, he said, unless I actually physically touch him, I will never believe. We'll come back to that. So three truths I want you guys to understand from this tonight. Uh, Jesus had a physical resurrection. Number one, Jesus had a physical resurrection. And the big emphasis on that is the word physical, right? Big emphasis on that. Jesus had a physical resurrection. Well, Nick, why is it important? I mean, if he res resurrected, what's it, why is it important that we understand that he had a physical resurrection. Well, what we see in this passage is we see that John is actually beginning to battle some early heresy in the church. Now, remember, this, this wasn't written like, you know, eight days after Thomas saw Jesus being raised from the dead. This was written many, many years later, right? In fact, a generation later after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. In fact, this was written for the purpose of kind of battling some of these early heresies. Um, and that's why he puts so much emphasis on this physical resurrection. We see uh, early Gnosticism. Who can tell me what Gnosticism is? Have you ever heard that term? Raise your hand if you've heard that term before. Yeah, Gnosticism, it comes from the Greek word gnosis, right? 
It's where we get stuff like diagnosis, right? And it means knowledge. It means knowledge. In fact, Gnosticism hadn't formally entered the scene just yet when John was written, but we're beginning to see some like early forms of it, okay, when this book was written. Um, in fact, Plato, y'all remember that philosopher Plato, right? Not the stuff you play with, but the philosopher. Plato said, knowledge is the key of understanding and even defeating evil, right? He said, if we want to defeat evil, if we want to understand evil and get past evil, then we must have more and more knowledge. In fact, the more knowledge that we have, he, would talk, he taught that um, the more knowledge that we have, we would be, eventually escape this reality and reach like a true reality of the afterlife, okay? So his goal, um, really interesting that God wrote on the heart of Plato that there's something wrong with the world, right? Do you see that? Do you see that in his statements? There's something wrong with the world. There's evil is corrupting the world, and we have to get away from evil, right? And so that's written on our hearts, right? Everyone knows that. We see evil in the world. And now his idea, though, was the more knowledge that we have, the more that we can escape these things. And so what happened was is these Gnostics, these people who may have at one time wanted to become a part of the church, they kind of took this Platonic philosophy and they mixed it with Christianity. Do you see that? So they, they began to teach things like, well, Jesus was, his teachings were great, but he wasn't a physical man. He was just a spirit or even an idea, right? Some of them that were even a little bit um, closer to the Christianity side would have said, well, Jesus lived and he was, and he walked and he did miracles, but when he died, that was it. He came back in a spirit type form or a philosophical type of form. Now, today, who else teaches that sort of thing? For bonus points. Who teaches that? There is a group that teaches that today that's very familiar to us. Does anybody know? That Jesus did not have a physical resurrection, but just kind of a spiritual or philosophical resurrection. Mormons, close, close. The other one, right? Jehovah's Witness, right? Jehovah's Witness, very good. Jehovah's Witness, they teach that. They teach that there was not a physical resurrection, but a spiritual resurrection. In fact, um, they, would, they would even say in their, in their uh, periodical, they would say, what's the name of their periodical? Somebody remind me. You, the Watchtower, right, that's right. They say that uh, Jesus like, resurrected from the dead, that he had a, phys- I mean, a spiritual resurrection, and God just kind of dissolved his body. Okay? Don't know why he would do that, but he did. So <laughs> apparently to the Jehovah's Witnesses teaching. Okay? So that is an actual form of Gnosticism, right? That's a form of Gnosticism. And so, Nick, why do we need to understand this? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that we pray to a living and breathing being, not an idea or a philosophy. Very important. We, we pray to a living creature, a living, well, actually not a creature, a living being, right? He hasn't been created. He's there, though. He's alive. And he's not just a figment or a philosophy or an idea. So here's my question to you guys. Knowing this knowledge, how should this change our lives, specifically our prayer lives as Christians? How should this change our prayer lives? You raise your hand. So, mm-hmm. We can speak directly to him? Okay, we don't have to go through a priest or anything else. We can speak directly to Jesus. What else? What else does this mean? This, huh? Right, yeah. Why would I pray to a dead idea or a dead, or a dead person, right? <laughs> Why would I pray to a dead person? Even if he resurrected as a spirit or even as an idea, I would not pray to something that wasn't alive. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think we should think about this when we pray, right? We should think about the resurrection when we pray. Because Jesus is alive. In other words, if, if I believe that Jesus is alive and I am praying to him, right, then that means I'm praying to someone who actually hears me. All right? And it will actually <laughs> give me real answers. And if, he's, if I pray to him and to, to, to a real being, that means I get real answers and real actions need to happen from me, right? Not just kind of this warm feeling. When Jesus commands us to do something, it's not an idea that we're following, but it's an actual person commanding us. Do you see the difference there? Like, it's a difference between knowing an idea that 
Um, let's just take uh, let's just take a military for the for an example, okay? It is a good idea that if you are going into a combat situation, you need to take a weapon, right? That's pretty smart, right? Somebody they're going to have weapons, they're going to fire at you. It's a good idea that you should take a weapon along with you, right? It's a whole different story when somebody says, "Hey, you really should take that weapon with you." Right, or it's a good idea to take that weapon with you when you say, I think I'm just going to handle it on my own, right? If it's an idea, you can do that. You can form an opinion with an idea, even though that would be a ridiculous opinion to not take a weapon into combat. You could have that opinion. It's a totally different story, isn't it, Doc, when you have a commander saying, get your weapon and take it into battle, right? That's going to make you move to action quickly, right? That's going to make you do something. It's no longer an idea. It's no longer a philosophy. It's a command, right? So when we pray to our God, when we pray to Jesus, remember that, that he will tell us something back. <laughs> and we, that will cause action, not just a, a good idea. So, yes, ma'am. Sure, sure. Right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. She said, Ms. Carolyn mentioned that, um, that we would actually see our loved ones in heaven, right? If they are believers in Christ, because of the resurrection, we know that they will too be with us in heaven. Right, that's a, that's a very comforting feeling, especially for, well, only for Christians really, right? So let's move on, let's move on. Number two, the first truth I said is we need to believe in a physical resurrection. We need to trust in a physical resurrection. But also, Jesus is the perfect example, or sorry, Jesus being the perfect example of a missionary now sends us out. Jesus being the perfect example of a missionary now sends us out. Look at verse 21 and 20 through 23. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So we see a testimony of the disciples, right? The disciples, what, does anybody know the passage, Romans 10, 9? Romans 10, 9, what does it say? Anybody know that? Somebody look it up for me. Who would look that up for me? Raise your hand. Romans 10, 9. I bet we can do it together. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. Very good, right? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So automatically we see this here, right? We see the disciples actually living out Romans 10, 9, right? What does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. He confesses him as God, right? And he obviously believes that he has come back to life. What does that mean? That means that the mission of God actually worked, right? So Jesus being the perfect example of a missionary now sends us out as missionaries. The first testimony that we see in the Bible is we see the disciples seeing Jesus. They've confessed him as Lord. He is God. And now they believe that God has raised him from the dead. He's alive right there. They physically touch him. And the first command is to, even as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Right? Now you remember my discussion at the beginning of this, you know, two different kind of gospels, two different accounts. Where else do we see this kind of sending out passage? The Great Commission. Very good, Sean. Matthew chapter 28. Right before his ascension. Right? And we don't, we don't, I mean, we see this placed here in John, John chapter 20. So, what does this mean? This means a, a really good seminary term, okay? Uh, uh, if you want to know seminary term tonight, listen up. Have y'all ever heard of missio dei? Missio dei, it's actually a Latin term, right? Missio dei. Missio dei really means the mission of God. Mission of God. And the mission of God is, is that God loved us and came to tell us the way to eternal life, even giving up his heavenly dwelling, to the discomforts of another place, even giving up his own life to make a way to him, right? Doesn't that sound like a missionary to you, right? Jesus is the first missionary. He's the perfect missionary. And him being that first missionary now sends us out, 
right? He went to a place, he left a very comfortable place in heaven, a place where um, he had authority, and he kind of left that authority and relied on another member of the Trinity, or relied on the Father's authority to be with him here on earth, a place that was very different from where he lived before. And he even gave up his own life so that we, his enemy, could know him. And he gives us that as an example to go and do that too, right? To go and go where it's discomforting, where it's uncomfortable, right, rather, and to make disciples. And so I'd encourage you, it's very interesting that Jesus does that. Why do you think he says that right after they come to know him? Right after they would be saved, according to Romans 10, 9. This is the salvation of the disciples, right? Why do you think that he would tell them to do that? Don't think too hard about it. Because he wants more disciples, right? He wants this kingdom to grow. It's very simple. Y'all are looking at me like, he's going to make this really strong point or not. No, no. The only reason that Jesus wants us to tell other people is says he wants his love to reach to other people. And in fact, he gives us the perfect example to even be uncomfortable in sharing the gospel. We too must give up our lives for this mission. And this is the first command after salvation. Now, let's look at verse 23. I'm sorry, 22. Because if I hope that this, this caught some of y'all. He kind of throws this Holy Spirit language in here real quick, and it's kind of confusing. And I want to clarify it. He says, when he had said this, after he kind of commissioned them, he breathed on them, right? Which is, you know, think about Jesus breathing on you. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from many, it is withheld. So the Holy Spirit question that we see here is this. Did the disciples receive the Spirit now or at the day of Pentecost, right? Because we have this story, right, the day of Pentecost. Somebody tell me what happened the day of Pentecost. Where were the disciples? They were in an upper room, right? And they were doing what? praying, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, right? Now, we see the disciples here in an upper room, right? And Jesus kind of breathes the Holy Spirit upon them. So did they receive the Holy Spirit here, or did they receive it later at Pentecost? These are two separate occasions, okay? And so that's the question. When did they, did they receive it here, or did they receive it later on? So, Dr. Burge, you got something to say? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can kind of be filled with the Spirit, right? We see Old Testament examples of David even, right, being filled with the Holy Spirit or, or the Spirit and doing something, you know, that only God could do. Yeah, we, we see that here. We also have the command that Jesus will, he said, the, when I leave, the Comforter will come, right? When I go is when the Holy Spirit will come. And so what I believe this is saying is that they were shown the Spirit, but they had not quite received him yet. And this was a command that when he comes, when he does come, not too much longer after this, for, at that time, receive him, right? So when he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit, almost in anticipation, almost as a prophecy that the Holy Spirit would come, right? Would come. Now, I could be wrong about that. You know, I'm interpreting that, but I believe that's correct. This could be um, Jesus kind of prophetically, just in the same way that he said, um, I, the temple will be destroyed and three days later it'll be, you know, I'll rebuild it. He was speaking about his death and resurrection, right? At that time, he did not die. It was later on the same way we see Jesus kind of prophetically saying, receive the Holy Spirit almost when he comes. And for us, this happens at salvation, right? This happens at salvation. We get a dose, of, we, get, we receive the Holy Spirit one time at salvation, okay? Now we can be, <coughs> excuse me, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit throughout our Christian walk, but there's only one time that we actually receive him. He comes in, he is with us, he 
changes us, moves our direction from ourselves to God. And so when the Spirit also comes, when the Spirit comes, we also receive authority. Look at verse 23 again. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now this is not saying that we as Christians have authority to forgive or withhold forgiveness within ourselves. That's not what this is saying. This doesn't mean that if somebody does a really, really ugly sin, we could say, you know what, I don't forgive you and because I don't forgive you, Jesus doesn't forgive you. That's not what this passage is saying. And at first glance, it kind of reads that way, but that's not what this passage is saying. This is stating that we now, having the Holy Spirit, having received it, can confidently tell a person they are forgiven based on or not forgiven, based on Christ, uh, Christ's authority. You follow me? Let me read that one more time. This is stating that we, now having the Holy Spirit, can confidently tell a person they are forgiven or not based on Christ's authority. <coughs> Let me give you an example. Let's say a, a Hindu friend comes to you, right? A, a friend from India, he comes to you, and he is a, a, a very big follower of Hinduism. And he denies Jesus' divinity, He's okay with Jesus as a philosopher or as a teacher or whatnot, but he will not say Jesus is God. Or if he does say Jesus is God, he says he's in a mix with all these other gods, right? That's very Hindu of him to do that. So um, we could say based on what? Scripture, that his sins are not forgiven. What scripture can we, can we base that on? Yeah, based on the Bible, right? What specific scripture? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I forget the reference, but um, forgive me for that. But yeah, and so that's not our authority, right? That's not our authority. But just, uh, just as you said, it's an it's a authority on Christ. It's through the Scripture, right? And so that's what this passage is saying. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. In other words... You can confidently say to the Muslim or to the Buddhist or to the atheist that if you do not believe in God, if you do not believe that Jesus is the physically resurrected son of the Father, your sins are not forgiven. Now, there's a great authority with that, especially in today's culture. Am I, not, am I right? Because today's culture wants to say, you know, whatever you feel like, it's okay. Whatever you believe in, God will just kind of accept you. There's kind of this, it is kind of creeping into this mainstream church sometimes, this inclusivist idea that it's like, whatever you believe in, it's okay, God will accept you. What you whatever you worship, God will accept you as worship to himself. And that's, that's unclear. We could say, based on scripture, not from our own authority, but on the authority of Jesus Christ. No, no, my friend, you... If you continue thinking this way, your sins are not forgiven, and hell is in your future, right? And that's authority. That's great authority. Because we can confidently say that, and we can confidently see people's lives changed to grow the kingdom of God. So, um, the final point here, the final point here, the resurrection calls us to worship. The resurrection calls us to worship. We see in verse 24 through 29 that more evidence is given for a physical resurrection. Not only did Jesus appear to the disciples and say, look, see my wounds, see my side, right? He actually tells Thomas to touch it. That's right, team. He says, Thomas, come touch it. Come touch it. This caused him to exclaim, my Lord and my God. Do y'all see that? It caused him to worship. And once again, we see Romans 10, 9 here, right? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Thomas saw Jesus. He believed in his heart that God raised him from the dead. And he said, my Lord and my God. And this too, if we go back to that group of Jehovah's Witnesses, this too is another heresy in their belief. They would not say that Jesus and God are one. They would not say that. Isn't that so satanic? Don't you see that? The two things that are required for salvation, confessing Jesus as Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, is the two things they break away on. We have compassion on people that view that way, right? We have compassion and love towards them and show them the truth of the scripture. But um, just a little side note, if a Jehovah's Witness, and I'm, I just, I'm interested in these things, so bear with me, but if a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, and they do, don't shun them away. Invite them in. In fact, tell them to open their translation of the Bible 
to this passage of Thomas, because this is one they kind of missed, all right? Thomas exclaims, my Lord and my God, and I want you to question them. I want you to ask them, is Thomas worshiping Jesus here? And if they're a good Jehovah's Witness, they will probably leave after that, but hopefully you will be able to counsel them and lead them to Christ from that, right? When we remember the resurrection, our reaction is always worship. This is why we come here on Sunday mornings, right? The first day of the week. To praise God for the resurrection. When we are reminded of the resurrection, it leads us to worship. Um, And this is why sometimes a Sunday morning will be dry. You ever come to a Sunday morning worship and you just feel like, man, people, it it just didn't feel like the spirit was there. You know, maybe they played a song you didn't like, or maybe the pastor, you could tell he kind of thrown his sermon together at the last minute or something like that. And I'm not saying, I don't think Brother Kevin does that at all. But, you know, you've, you've been in services like me. You've been there where you felt like, it's just dry. I just didn't feel that excited to worship God this morning. I'm going to tell you, that's what Satan wants to do to you every single Sunday morning. In fact, he'll put so many barriers before you come to this place to keep your mind off of one thing and one thing only, the resurrection of Jesus. Because he knows, like Thomas saw this, when you see Christ, the resurrected Christ, when you are reminded of the resurrection, you worship. You worship. So I would encourage you guys, when you encounter another Sunday morning like that, don't blame the pastor. Don't blame the music minister, right? All right? I want you guys to look in your own heart and think about the resurrection. I promise you, you'll worship if you are indeed one of his. Don't forget the resurrection. So, finally, we see that we as Christians are blessed for believing without seeing. God kind of speaks to us in this passage, right? In the past, he speaks to us knowing that, have you believed, verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So we are, as Christians, we are kind of basing our own testimony of meeting God off of the testimony of these early believers, of these disciples who saw Jesus face to face. And God kind of commends that. He says, blessed are those who believe without even seeing. I mean, I think of this passage, he was thinking about us. He was thinking about the church today. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. So take encouragement by that. And I'll conclude with this, just to recap what we've learned, and I'll take a few questions if we have time. It says, Jesus is physically alive. He's physically alive, and he commands us to go to those, even unlike us, with authority. And he gives us the strength through the spirit and knowledge of the resurrection. So if you can take anything from this, know that Jesus is alive. We pray to a living, breathing creature. I mean, I keep saying creature. He's not created. A living, being, breathing person, right? And who is alive today, who has given us authority to share the gospel and even commands us to go and gives us strength through spirit, the spirit, the knowledge of the resurrection. Any questions that you guys have tonight on this? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your kindness, God. Thank you that even now as we pray, Lord, we know that you hear us. That you're not some idea or philosophy, God, but you are a living thing. You're alive. And God, I pray that even right now as we think about you being alive and we think about the resurrection and how you had authority to lay your life down and pick it back up again, Lord, that that makes you God and that makes you worthy of worship. And so, God, I pray that you remind us, Holy Spirit, remind us of this throughout the week, that we might not, may not just worship you on Sunday morning, but every single day of our lives. And the more that you remind us of the resurrection, God, give us an also remembrance of the command you tell us to go and to share. So as we face people that do not know you, may we tell them of your resurrection and your lordship. It's in Jesus' name and his authority, I pray. Amen.